Subcommittee on Aging and Senior Services. I'm Susan Donovan, Chair of this committee. Clerk, could you please take the roll? Chairwoman Donovan? Present. Representative Agello? Whip Chippendale? Present. Representative Edwards? Representative Slater. Okay, that completes the roll. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Speaker Shikarchi and Leader Lezajewski for establishing five separate subcommittees under the Oversight Committee. The goal of this committee is to inform our constituencies and other House members on programs, services, and policy work concerning aging and senior services. Today, our guests include Dr. Beth Dugan, who leads the research team that created the 2020 Rhode Island Healthy Aging Data Report. Dr. Dugan is a member of the Governor's Council to Address Aging Issues in Massachusetts, a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, and on the faculty at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Our second guest, Maureen Magritte, is Vice Chair of the Rhode Island Long-Term Care Coordinating Committee. Council, uh, sorry, Coordinating Council, and Chair of its Aging in the Community Subcommittee. Maureen is a former director of Rhode Island Department of Elderly Affairs and an author of several data and research reports on older Rhode Islanders. So, welcome ladies, and uh, we're gonna begin with Dr. Dugan. has shared her screen. Um, we can, she is muted. Okay. Okay, how's that? Do we, okay. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about Healthy Aging in Rhode Island. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. And um, it's exciting to be here for the inaugural meeting of the Oversight uh, Committee's Subcommittee on Aging and Senior Services. So thank you to uh, Chair Donovan and um, represent, Representative Chippendale for your presence and uh, Director Jones and Maureen as Maureen Magritte as well. Uh, the research that I'm going to present to you now is, uh, has been supported by the Tufts Health Plan Foundation. Uh, and because this is a relatively small group, if you have any questions, please don't be shy. You can just ask them while I'm presenting uh, and we can adjust uh, as we go forward. So here, everything that I'll be presenting uh, can be found on this website, the healthyagingdatareports.org. And this is uh, the repository for data reports that we have done uh, throughout New England. We've done a number of reports in Massachusetts, a number in Rhode Island. Uh, we've completed one in New Hampshire, and we will soon be rolling out one in Connecticut. And uh, prior to the pandemic, I used to joke that we were like a virus spreading throughout uh, New England, but I try to stay away from that um, at the present time. So here is the um, cover of the Healthy Aging Day Report Highlights document. And um, the tools that we've created to inform policy and service delivery, uh, advocacy and education efforts include uh, community profiles for every uh, municipality in Rhode Island, plus um, a couple neighborhoods uh, in Providence. Uh, we have created uh, community profiles for the core cities, um, 194 maps with community rank, uh, rates listed alphabetically and ranked high to low. And for the uh, more data savvy user, we have um, created the community profiles with the confidence interval or the standard error reported, as well as extensive technical documentation. There are also 18, <coughs> excuse me, 18 interactive web maps, an infographic and a highlights report. So 
uh, really anything that uh, you could be interested in related to healthy aging, we hope that we have um, put there. And in addition, we are available as time allows for ad hoc analyses or um, uh, data generation to support urgent policy issues. And Maureen would be the best uh, conduit for that. So if you had questions um, that you thought we could answer, please uh, contact Maureen and she'll uh, coordinate with us. Now, before I get to some of the findings, I want to spend just a little time telling you about the data and methodology of the Health Aging Data Report, because our aspiration is that these reports will inform policy. And why would you uh, believe us if you didn't know where we got the data or what we did um, uh, with it? So to uh, be transparent in our analysis, we have uh, three main um, data sources for the population and health uh, population housing and some of the financial indicators. We use data from the US Census Bureau, uh, which is part of the uh, Department of Commerce, now headed by uh, former Governor Raimondo, um, the American Community Survey data uh, allows us to really drill down into quite local levels. Another thing that's unique about the data reports is that we have information from uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so this allows us to report on chronic disease prevalence, uh, disabling conditions, behavioral health issues, and uh, Medicare service utilization rates that uh, similar report, other reports uh, don't have. This data is difficult to get and difficult to analyze, and so it's kind of a unique feature. And then there's also... The, uh, very interesting information from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, um, and that tells us a lot of information about preventive health practices and some healthcare access. Now, the way that we're able to make this data work is we report it um, a very pragmatic approach and use a hierarchical uh, approach to reporting. So, as data allows, we report for every geographic unit. And when there are uh, some limitations to the data, we report at different tiers and all the communities that are clustered in those tiers um, uh, would get the same value. And for a few indicators, we're only able to report a statewide rate. So for instance, autism among uh, people 65 plus driving under the influence and uh, marijuana uh, consumption, all of that uh, is so infrequent, we can only report a state rate. So here, if you click, uh, if you're on Healthy Aging Data Reports and click on the Rhode Island Report, it takes you to the website. And here are the different products along the left um, margin. And then you can click on also hyperlinks here. And the backbone of the data report are these community profiles. And this is where we report, uh, I believe it's 197 indicators for Rhode Island, and uh, we report the community estimate and then the state estimate. Uh, and again, we do this for 41 geographic units in Rhode Island, so it's um, very locally focused data uh, so that you can know what your constituents or uh, who are the people in your community uh, and what are the what's the situation in terms of healthy aging. So. We've got a lot of information about population characteristics, um, including age, the number of people who are 60 and older in your community, or the state rate, the race, ethnicity, marital status, education level, um, veterans, LGBTQ, and then the mortality rate on this first page. The second page we get into wellness, falls, prevention, nutrition and diet, oral health, and chronic disease indicators. And you may uh, see these Bs and, or Ws or an asterisk in this column, and that highlights or flags an indicator where the rate is significantly uh, better compared to the state rate. Uh, the next page, we continue with chronic disease indicators, uh, behavioral health indicators, mental health, Okay, there we go. 
uh, disability, caregiving, access to care, health services utilization, community factors, safety and crime, transportation, housing, and then we finish up with economic indicators and cost of living. So again, this is for uh, every community in a few neighborhoods. Now, what the data report allows us to do is we can look for communities that are significantly better, uh, you know, what communities have the best rates. Uh, let's see, I'm going to ask folks to please mute yourselves if you're not speaking. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you can look and see communities that have the best rates, some communities have the bad rates uh, or worst rates, and uh, for different interventions, we may want to surge resources to the communities with the uh, uh, worst rates, and there may be lessons or uh, something underwritten in communities that have lots of positive rates. So population characteristics. You may want to wonder where, how many older people in Rhode Island are there. And this map shows you the population 65 plus, one dot equals 100 people. And so you can see there are older people all across the state. And then you can see here the alphabetical listing and then the um, uh, list from high to low in, uh, uh, um, in this column. You may have another question saying, where are communities that have a lot of older people living in them? And this map tells that story. And you can see the state average is 16.5% uh, of residents in most communities are 65 plus. But you can see there are some the communities shaded in orange or red have rates uh, quite a bit higher than that. Uh, And then uh, people may wonder where, uh, this tells us where the uh, people who live alone and are age 65 or older. And some of the health indicators. So Alzheimer's disease is a serious concern. Uh, and for every person who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you can count on it impacting five to 10 other people who are helping um, that person to manage day-to-day -day life. And so here you can see there are some, uh, the state average is 13% of the older population has Alzheimer's disease, but again, there are some communities where the rate is as high as 20%. Asthma is something uh, uh, air quality and other interventions that we can do to uh, um, prevent or uh, mitigate the impact of asthma. And this shows the statewide distribution of uh, asthma among 65 plus. And the percentage of the population 65 plus with ambulatory difficulties, again, statewide average is 21%. And if you can look at the orange or red areas, you can see those are communities with rates um, at the high end. And then falls are a huge concern, and it can also be a start of a downward cascade in terms of uh, the consequences for someone. So here, the percentage of people age 60 plus who had a fall within the past 12 months, 26%. Uh, uh, and looking at the community shaded in orange or red, you can see those are even higher rates. and the percentage of people 60 plus who were injured in a fall within the last year, about 10% of people 60 and older. And then mental health. Um, there's increasing recognition that uh, being sad or lonely or depressed is not a normal part of human aging. Um, and so knowing where people are struggling with mental health issues again, can allow us to surge supports and programs and interventions to help. So here you can see the statewide average of people who've ever been diagnosed with uh, depression is uh, almost one in three, which is a rather high rate. And you can see that uh, uh, the highest rates appear um, 
Warwick province uh, in that area. The percentage of people who report having adequate emotional support, this is really encouraging. In fact, uh, basically 80% of people 60 and older report having adequate emotional support, which is uh, a great strength of, of the community. And caregiving, so the percentage of grandparents who are facing grandchildren, often this occurs because there's um, a crisis in a family. And while you can see the state average is uh, about 1% among people 65 plus who are raising their grandchildren, uh, you can see it can be um, uh, 1.5 1 to 2.1% in the community shaded in red. And then people who are performing what we think of as traditional uh, care uh, caregiving is represented in this map. And so, um, yeah, the feedback has really cut down. So thank you for whoever solved that problem. Uh, with this map, you can see the percentage of people who are providing care to a family or a friend in the last month, and that's 22.5%. Uh, but again, the communities shaded in orange and red have the highest rates. And here, um, <laughs> what I, I hope you take a look at is the communities that don't have any color uh, shading. Uh, these are the communities, um, uh, the location of dementia-related support groups. <clears throat> and you can see that most of the state does not have uh, dementia-related support groups in their uh, area. So increasing access to that could potentially uh, yield benefits and really help people who are dealing with a difficult circumstance. And then here I <coughs> decided to use this infographic to summarize some of the other analyses that we did uh, instead of a lot of tables with uh, lists of communities and values and so on. And with this uh, I'll just uh, walk, walk you through um, different parts. So this piece here where it's um, making progress and more work to be done, what this reflects is an analysis of um, trends in healthy aging. So we did our last report uh, in Rhode Island in 2016 and then just released this one in 2020. And so we were able to look back at um, the results we had for the 2016 report and then see how things had changed in a fairly brief period of time. And uh, what you can be proud of and what is paying off um, uh, in terms of the COVID vaccination rate, you can see that you, your vaccination rates for uh, pneumonia vaccine, the shingles vaccine, uh, had improved by a large percentage, 5.8 uh, and 5%. And the best predictor of future uh, immunization is past immunization. So the fact that you're leading the nation uh, with COVID uh, vaccine rates among people 65 plus is really something to be proud of and is reflects work that's been going on um, for several years, I would guess, uh, from the um, uh, Director Jones's group and the Department of Health's uh, efforts. You can also see there are improvements in diabetes, anemia, congestive heart failure, and ischemic heart disease. So those were all positive changes uh, in over four years time in the data. And where we see rates have gotten worse for chronic kidney disease, arthritis, depression, uh, hypothyroidism, high cholesterol, asthma, and living below the poverty line. So here, and again, these data are um, uh, from before COVID. So we would expect we're, we'll see, you know, uh, higher rates of emotional distress and um, some other uh, disturbing indicators in the future, but understanding where we were uh, prior to COVID. So that's the change over time analyses. Then we looked for racial disparities. We know that um, uh, racism is baggage and has consequences for the health of children, and we carry those effects uh, in until the day we die. And so we do see that uh, in older black or African American adults had higher rates on uh, many indicators 
uh, 25 indicators related to serious and complex chronic disease. Older Hispanic people had higher rates um, on eight indicators, including Alzheimer's disease, depression, and liver disease. We see uh, among older Asian adults, the rates for having no chronic conditions, which is actually, um, they're doing best with low chronic, uh, uh, chronic disease burden, um, seems to be an advantage, but it could also be an artifact of the data that we may have um, uh, some reluctance. Uh, again, our chronic disease indicators come from Medicare data, and we know that some cultures rely on traditional healers where you pay out of pocket, it may not generate a Medicare claim. So um, we, we find uh, racial disparities uh, on many, many measures of uh, chronic disease and um, it's a justice issue. We think everyone should have a fair chance to healthy aging, and we're not there yet. We still have a good bit of work to do. We also find gender differences uh, in regard to healthy aging. And, it, you know, aging is a universal experience, um, but men and women um, have different opportunities and expectations related to our gender roles. And, uh, we see women, older women, do better uh, in terms of nutrition, getting rec uh, consuming recommended levels of fruits and vegetables. Men do better with uh, uh, getting regular physical activity. Those are gender differences that are clear. We see older women have greater stress about uh, buying food, higher rates of falls, and higher rates of depression compared to men. Men have higher rates of heart disease, chronic kidney disease and diabetes. So there are gender differences too. And again, it may be the tailoring of interventions or programs knowing where these disparities exist. And then just a reminder that less than 5% of the older population lives in long-term care settings. The vast majority of people are in their community uh, contributing to the community at a very high level and with high rates of life satisfaction. So I think at this point, uh, I'll pause and uh, see if you have questions or if there are other uh, specific data points um, you are interested in. So let me stop the sharing so everybody's screen can come up. And if there are uh, any questions or uh, data points that would be helpful to you, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, does anybody have a question? Uh, Chair, your uh, mic is muted. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, does does anyone have a question? Beth, this is Maureen. Um, you know, um, this is such a comprehensive report. Can people hear me okay? Yes. Um, and I can spend, you know, an hour at a time just going through it and trying to absorb uh, the enormous amount of data. But one, one uh, screenshot you showed was the lack of Alzheimer's support groups in, I think it was the western part of the state. And um, so I'm going to bring that to the attention of our Alzheimer's group um, because I think that they might want to look at that because we do have some support groups and we have um, a, we have some memory cafes which are available um, if people can get online um, and let people know about those support groups. So um, it was good that you pointed that out, Beth, because there has been a significant emphasis in the state on looking at Alzheimer's disease and how we can support um, both the care carer and the person with Alzheimer's disease. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, I noticed that my own community didn't have any support um, groups in that area. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about that, Maureen, at another time. And, and Yes. And I, you know, I, I'm sure I could find a place for it. I just would need someone, you know, to run the meeting and I would help, you know, I certainly would want to help with that. Oh, that would be great because I know um, Tufts, found, Tufts Health Plan Foundation um, for several years gave out what they call momentum grants. And I know Bristol got one to do some 
education of people in the community about Alzheimer's and dementia. So I think there'd be a lot of openness to that, Representative Donovan. Yes, thank you. Any other yeah. questions? Um, well, the, the one comment I wanted to make, this is um, Rose Jones from Office of Healthy Aging. Um, just piggybacking on what Maureen shared is we've also been investing heavily in um, expanding people's access to technology and moving a lot of services or, ex you know, enhancing services by offering them virtually as well. And I know in the space of dementia supports, particularly for the carer, um, there has been a lot of progress on that front in expanding virtual opportunities. So I do wonder, Dr. Dugan, how, you know, when we think about um, the pandemic, right, we often think about like what kind of impacts the pandemic has had um, and many, of course, being in the negative category, but some that are in the positive category is the progress we've made in bridging the digital divide for folks and being able to provide more and more supports in a virtual way. Um, so I wonder how the map would look, you know, current day, given a lot of those efforts that we are continuing to make through the DigiH Collaborative, um, but then even more broadly across all of our different partner networks. I know our Alzheimer's and dementia grant specifically looking at, is looking at enhancing these types of support groups across the state. Um, and during the pandemic, the focus really has been on virtual um, opportunities. So just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Great. Um, Dr. Du uh, Dugan, are you, you're not finished with the report, are you? Is she with, oh, uh, with the slides, yeah, I have others, but I, I think the infographic is the, uh, let me share one more slide. Um, <laughs> and this is our research team. Oh, okay. And so uh, normally we're on the left in our beautiful Seaside campus, but in the past year we've been living in Zoom boxes or WebEx boxes uh, as we work on the report. And uh, the group is really motivated by trying to translate data into um, tools that build knowledge and awareness and then spur action and uh, policy um, uh, and program uh, implementation. So we're grateful for the funding from the Tufts Health Plan Foundation and the support from the Gerontology Institute. Um, and again, uh, if there are any questions or if people want to learn more about uh, Rhode Island, it's healthyagingdatareports.org and then clicking on the Rhode Island uh, icon to have access to all these tools and uh, really um, more data um, that you can then you can probably use. Um, but I'm happy to help in any format going forward that would be useful to the subcommittee uh, or to um, uh, uh, Director Jones and her team as you try to uh, address the opportunities and the challenges of uh, aging Rhode Island. Yes, um, Dr. Dugan, have health equity zones asked? And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Maureen unless there are oh, other questions. I have a question first. Oh. Um, have any of the local health equity zones asked um, you to help them um, with the information in the report? Do they do they have they obviously have access to it? Yeah, we haven't um, uh, had. We we've consulted people from the, who are leading efforts in the health equity zones um, during the data uh, crunching phase. But we haven't had that much call for special analyses or anything. Our 20 core zip code um, community profiles match up nicely with the uh, health equity zones. So we've tried to um, create tools that will help. But um, yeah, that, I, I really admire the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. The health equity zones, I think, are um, the momentum to build on in terms of expanding their work to healthy aging uh, in, in a more robust manner if possible. Yeah, just to, to add on to that, Representative, for, um, for your knowledge, one of um, the presentations I was fortunate to be able to do in the early days of the pandemic, and then we did it more recently over the last couple months, is to the health equity zones and, of course, to my colleague in the cabinet, Dr. Alexander Scott. Um, and we talked a lot about the Healthy Aging Data Port, uh, 
data report and the ways we're already leveraging it to inform policy and investments in Rhode Island, such as through the DigiH Collaborative, which I mentioned, and I know that Maureen is going to touch on, so I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, but we are leveraging it and certainly sharing with our partners in the health equity zones. Thank you. So let's turn to Maureen Magritte. Um, she's our second guest. And as I said before, the vice chair of the Rhode Island Long-Term Care Coordinating Council and chair of its aging in the community subcommittee. Um, Maureen is the former director of the Rhode Island Department of Elderly Affairs, as I said before, and she's um, she's worked for the, um, I guess, the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council on, I don't know for how long, Maureen, how long have you been there? Um, I actually um, worked with the council when I was uh, director of policy for former Lieutenant Governor Charlie Fogarty. He chaired the council at the time, and I sort of staffed the council for um, eight or ten years. And then I have worked as co-chair or vice chair along with Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee um, for six years now. So it's been quite some time that I've had some involvement with the long-term care coordinating council. Um, I'm getting feedback on the audio. Is anybody else getting feedback? Yes, yeah. it appears that when the State House Live Feed 101 has an open mic, we get feedback. I'm not sure if the guys in the control room can hear me on that, but that seems to be the issue. Yeah, um, okay, so it's not coming from me. No, we've checked all no. the mics. Um, okay, um, I'm, this is my first time trying to share on WebEx, so bear with me, everybody. Somewhere. Well, that's not working. Can anybody see it? We see it, but it's the small, it's not the, it's the small show. one. Yeah. Okay. I just have to figure out that. You, if you enlarge your screen, maybe. Sorry about that. Yeah. Hi, Maureen. Just try running the slideshow. Yeah. What? Try to run the slideshow. Try to run the slideshow? Yes. Start. You can play from beginning. Um, but can you see it? Because yeah. I can't see it. We can see it. Just if you press that. Try to press play from <laughs> beginning. I just can't figure out how to Under file. get it on my screen. What? Under file, it says from beginning, play. Up. I know, but my problem is I can't see it. So. Oh. Um. Let's see if you want to email your slides to me, Maureen. I'm happy to. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say, Doctor. You beat me, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so sorry about this. Did I lose everybody? <laughs> Did I lose everybody? No. Oh, I hear you. All right. So I just have to find the... Do you see anything? Um, you can unmute me and... Oh, okay. Um, Maureen, did you mail the slides to um, Beth Dugan? Okay. And she can put them up. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask um, Director Johns to just talk a little about what she's been doing through the, uh, through the pandemic. While I 
do this mailing. Sure, I'm happy to, Maureen, as always. Um, so, of course, we uh, our office, the Office of Healthy Aging, has been involved in pandemic response since the very beginning, early days of the pandemic. I was serving um, in two capacities, both as the director of this office as well as leading one of the work streams, the quarantine and isolation work stream on behalf of the governor. Um, and many things that we've been involved in, of course, are aligned very much with our mission to help people age strong. As we know, older adults are disproportionately impacted by this virus. So if anything, we just doubled down on our mission and doubled down where we could through relief funding from the federal government and other available funds, insurging our many steady state programs, such as home delivered meals, helping our um, community partners pivot their service offerings, such as you know the many congregate meals, uh, community style meals that we provide at senior centers across the state, helping the senior centers pivot um, and either do home delivery of services or um, stay open for certain services um, in, in alignment, of course, with public health guidance. So a lot of the work was centering around surging all of those steady state programs we have, and then bringing on um, new programs that were filling system gaps. So some of these things are like we've never in the state of Rhode Island had a culturally relevant um, hot meals program for older adults in need across the state and specifically in our communities, such has been highlighted, Beth, in, in your report, um, in those communities where we know that food access is a challenge, where we know that folks um, are lower income and really desperately in need of some support. We were able to innovate um, with community partners and local restaurants and develop a culturally relevant hot meals program in addition to a grocery and personal care and cleaning supply program. Um, so we're really proud of that. We did it, of course, in partnership with community partners. And also something that Maureen is gonna highlight today as a great example of how we've leveraged the Healthy Aging Data Report, which I could talk about for hours, by the way, and can't thank Beth and her team enough for compiling. Um, because we have, over the last year or so, you know, we had early access to some of the data. Um, so we were able to leverage this data and make really informed decisions about the, you know, the pilots that I just talked about, but also huge efforts like bridging the digital divide for older adults across the state, particularly with the expansion of telehealth across the state. It's wonderful to expand. It's wonderful to have that service. But if people don't have access to the devices or the fluency to use them and understand the functionality, um, then unfortunately, we don't get the great benefit of expanding telehealth across the state. We know that one in four older adults, thank you, Beth, one in four older adults across the state lack access to technology. Um, and we put our heads together, and I want to give a huge shout out to Maureen. Again, she's going to touch on it, but Maureen is my digi age co thinker, co founder, um, and partner in, in all things digital. Um, to really make sure that this was going to be a successful effort um, led by a really thoughtful strategic plan that um, basically was built around four pillars. Get devices to people that need them through an equity lens. Make sure that they have the training, the digital literacy. Make sure that there is internet service available, which is typically the hugest barrier that people, um, you know, face is in having access to affordable internet service. And then, of course, making sure that there's robust user-centric content available to folks. So we're really proud of what we've been able to do. Again, Maureen is going to speak to it, so I'll stop talking. But I will say, as a state, I'll land on this in terms of digital equity because it's a big focus area. It was important before the pandemic. Pandemic magnified the need for it. We're going to continue um, to need to address the, the digital divide. So as we talk as a state about um, you know big broadband infrastructure, we're very pleased to be partnering with Commerce and making sure that our older adults are one of the target populations for any investments that we make as a state. We're really proud of that work and we must remain vigilant. So with that, Maureen, I'll stop. I'll come back to you unless you want me to keep going. You know, I could go on all day. Well, I, am, I, am, I sent the slides. I sent the slides to Beth. I sent the slides to Beth. All right. Beth, Beth did you get them? Not yet. Oh, oh dear. dear. 
but all right. Well, do you want to? Can you end? Wait, um, I'm waiting. Well, are there any um, any questions from anyone on on anything we've been doing at the Office of Healthy Aging or on DigiH specifically? Because this is something that again. Do you do you see the slide now? No, she doesn't but have them yet. I don't think. Did people see them? Oh. Um, Maureen, you logged no. in three times. You don't see them? <laughs> no. Because no. They're, on my, they're on my screen. So, um, Maureen, can you just read, could you, you read go, the slides? Oh, you're sharing something. Hold on. Stand by. Okay. okay. Here it is. So, hey. Okay. There you go. You just need to um, go into full screen mode. So, just start your presentation. From the beginning, there you go. Hey, can we all clap? <laughs> I really, I really apologize about that. Um, well, as I said, I've been associated with the long-term care co-ops council on and off, and um, that feedback is uh, difficult. But the council is a 33-member group. It was created way back in 1987 by statute. It includes members of the legislature. And we just welcomed Representative Susan Donovan as our newest legislative member. It includes long-term care providers, community members, long-term care workers, um, advocates. And um, prior to the pandemic, we would meet in person and although that's not a real picture, it really looks like the space that we did meet in. And for the past year, we've had to switch to virtual meetings. But that has worked out quite well. We range from having anywhere from virtually 50 people when we've had uh, Dr. Jim McDonald on to talk about COVID, we've had over 100 people. Um, over the years, some of the legislation that we have promoted have been creation of a long-term care ombudsman statute for the state, a client bill of rights for home care clients, promoted funding for respite for our older caregivers, um, rebalancing long-term care spending, um, enacted a criminal background check law for long-term care workers, and promoted enhanced information referral and assessment. Um, so if you're not sure about long-term care and what it entails, because many people think nursing home only, but long-term care is really any help that a person receives over a length of time to help them with daily tasks. And we talk about activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. The activities of daily living are generally bathing, getting dressed, mobility, toileting, continence. The instrumental activities of daily living are higher functioning activities that we all take for granted until we can't handle them any longer. But it's managing our money, transportation, shopping, preparing meals, using communication devices, managing our medications, doing laundry and household tasks. And these are, are important because many programs use benchmark activities of daily living for eligibility. For example, in Rhode Island, you have to meet certain criteria to be eligible for nursing home payment under Medicaid. Um, in some long-term care insurance policies, you have to meet certain ADL or ID, ADL requirements. Um, over the years, the Long-Term Care Council has produced a number of reports. Um, way back in the mid-1990s, it produced a very comprehensive long-term care plan, building, the, uh, working together to make the pieces fit. And that was based upon focus groups throughout the state, listening to people, what their needs are, and get their thoughts on what we should provide. Now, all these years later, we're still working on some of the objectives in that report. Two that we're working on right now 
um, a person-centered options counseling. So to really sit down with the person who needs care and their caregiver if they have one, to really go through the options with them and what would be the best long-term care service for them and their circumstances and to meet their caregiver needs. Um, we've produced two state plans on Alzheimer's. The latest was led by um, Chairman McKee. Um, that was issued in 2019 and the state is really working toward um, looking at those recommended activities and the Department of Health has just hired a uh, person to direct the work for Alzheimer's disease in the state. So that's very exciting. And then finally, the council has had a number of subcommittees. The Alzheimer's work was done through a subcommittee. And then in 2014, the um, state legislature passed the Aging and Community Subcommittee, which uh, commenced work and provided a research report and also a strategic plan in 2016. What I thought I'd do is show you where long-term care services and supports are in the state. And so I produced this table for you showing at the very highest level we have the Elena Slater Hospital which has had a lot of discussion and um, look lately from the House Oversight Committee, the Senate Oversight Committee, and the um, House Finance Committee, and the Senate Finance Committee. But back in February, we had a report on the Ellen Slater Hospital, and at that time, they said there were 195 residents throughout the three facilities. Today, we have 83 licensed nursing facilities, and if we look back a couple of decades, we had about 102, probably in the early 2000s. So you can see we've had a reduction in the number of facilities. You can see how many nursing facility beds we have. Prior to the pandemic, I think occupancy was close to 95%. Um, when I checked about a month and a half ago, I think it was down to 75% because of the pandemic. Um, we have 64 assisted living residences, and you can see how many units they would hold. We have 35 adult day programs, which is probably double from the early 2000s. Many of those programs uh, were closed during the pandemic, and they're starting to open now. We have uh, 56 home nursing care providers and 27 home care providers. We have some shared living programs with a number of people participating in those. We have a personal choice program in which people hire their own personal care attendant and you can see how many people are served by that program. The newest type of long-term care provider we have are called independent providers. This is a program that the General Assembly authorized in 2019. It's been a little slow starting because of the pandemic, but I'm pleased to report we now have 32 certified independent providers. And this is a program where people can select their own provider and really direct their own care. In addition to that, we have one statewide case program, which stands for Program for Alternate Care of the Elderly. And the last figure I saw, they had 432 participants. Now at the high end, I talked about the Elena Slater Hospital, where we have some of the people with the highest level of need. But I also talk about home delivered meals, because that's a program that really keeps people living in the community. Some research done by Brown University researchers really showed that in Rhode Island, that program can defer people from going into nursing homes and for a very small amount of money, keep people living in the community. And I show you most recently 
how many meals they are delivering daily to clients. And then finally, research tells us that the vast number of long-term care services are really provided by our unpaid family caregivers. AARP has done a um, national study on caregivers, and the latest study, they showed we had 136,000 caregivers in Rhode Island providing care that was valued at $1.8 billion. So um, that gives you the array of long-term care services we have in the state. Um, we passed a law uh, several years ago that requires the state to put annual reports out showing the amount of money spent on long-term care in the various types of providers and the number of people being served. And in this, I'm showing you information from the latest report that was issued just about two weeks ago. And you can see um, the amount of money in total that was spent hasn't increased that much since 2014. It's about 2%. But the interesting thing is that we see a slight decrease in money going towards people 65 and older. That's a slight decrease and a slight increase in services going toward people under age 65. That report is really fascinating and I put the website where people can get to it because it's worth a look. In this, um, I provided a couple of pie charts which really show where we spend our money. In 2008, the General Assembly enacted a law which contained a goal that the state spend 50% of its long-term care spending for people age 65 and older and persons with disabilities on home and community-based services. This shows you where we are in, uh, for fiscal 2020 spending. For all ages, and this excludes expenditures for IDDD, home and community-based services, but the figure was 26% spent on home and community services. And for people just 65 and older, it was 22%. So we still have a very long way to go to reach that targeted goal. Nationally, the AARP puts out a scorecard every several years. Its most recent scorecard was put out last year, and it showed the national average for spending on long-term care, home and community services was 45%. I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about the Aging Community Subcommittee. As I said, that was enacted into law in 2014. What we did, um, I volunteered to chair that group. By law, it had to include persons from academia, people from state agencies, and people from the community and advocates. We decided to use the framework developed by the World Health Organization in looking at age-friendly communities. And we determined we wanted to look at nine interrelated domains. Interestingly, these are the domains people talk about when we talk about the social determinants of health, which really um, research shows is that those social determinants of health really reflect about 80% of a person's health as opposed to the actual health care that they receive. We developed a strategic plan uh, addressing each of those nine domains, and we came up with 74 recommended strategies across those domains. We did a progress report at the end of 2019, and that showed that 78% of those strategic actions were really completed or they were works in progress. And some of the results, we worked to get the community grants for senior services restored. We worked to get the no-fare bus passes restored. 
We worked to get additional funding for respite services restored and to address a significant waiting list. We promoted, and thanks to Director Jones, we finally have a very active and comprehensive Office of Healthy Aging Point website. Um, and I think Director Jones talked about some of the work done in food and nutrition. We did some work based on work done by Beth Dugan's colleagues at the University of Massachusetts looking at elder basic needs. And they put out, um, I think it was just updated, if you want to know how much it costs for an older person or an older couple living in Rhode Island to meet their basic needs, go to Elder Index and you'll see by county in Rhode Island what a couple or a single person would need based upon if they're a renter, a homeowner, in good health or poor health. So thanks and kudos again to Beth Dugan and those champions um, that she works with. I put this slide up because I wanted to show that uh, we put the Healthy Aging Data Report into action. And Director Jones talked about DGH, which is the program to bridge the digital divide. And we used the research that Beth Dugan did to show where we were really poor in internet access for all the population. So in strategizing about bringing the digital world to older adults in Rhode Island, we really thought it important to look at the hottest hit communities, which we have done. I think um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done on DigiAge, and I'll just highlight, I think I have maybe a minute left here, um, our, what we call our flagship program. It's a partnership with the University of Rhode Island in which over the course of a year, we want to bring digital devices, training, connectivity if needed, and content, digital content to 200 older adults living in some of our hottest hit communities. The program already is going fantastically well. I think we have probably 150 participants uh, at this time. URI is working in partnership with five community and senior center agencies who have identified participants. Those participants will be trained by well-trained students who have gone through a training program called Cyber Seniors to work with older adults one-on-one. -on -one. They start on the telephone. They teach the person how to use what we're providing is a Apple iPad to all participants. They're preloaded with important programs. Um, so it's very, very exciting. I asked um, if they had a good story to tell. And one was a older person in her 80s who was taught how to use Zoom on her iPad and she wanted to attend a Providence City Council meeting online, which she did. And she was so excited and she was able to send an email to her council person about whatever issue was important to her. So that's just one example of how our older community can really get into the digital age. Um, I wanted to end up by talking about uh, one of the domains where we really need to continue to do a lot of work, and that's in the area of elder economic security. And we have four pieces of legislation that would really go far in addressing elder economic security. Um, one that I particularly want to talk about is expansion of the Office of Healthy Aging at Home Cost Share Program. Fortunately, Governor McKee's budget includes uh, about $850,000 to expand the program to include people up to 250% of the poverty level and also those with Alzheimer's under age 65. So that is a bill that is a priority because one of our concerns is 
the low income person not poor enough to be on Medicaid with its very strict income guidelines, um, but yet so poor that they really can't afford the $25 or $27 an hour cost of home care. And this is a program that now serves, I think, about 1,500 persons with home care and adult day service. So that's a real priority, along with the others I mentioned here. The other challenge and a big issue, I think it's the biggest challenge in long-term care is workforce. And one of the things I like to talk about is that it's time to pay our direct care staff a living wage. We have seen tremendous hardship on the part of direct care workers across the long-term care uh, system, nursing homes, home care, through the pandemic. Um, we're looking at a starting wage of $15 an hour. There is some legislation introduced by Senator De Palma that would put that into effect. And I really think it's time we paid our long-term care workers wages that are deserving of the invaluable service they perform for all of us in taking care of our parents, our grandparents, people with disabilities, and children with special needs. So I'm going to end there. I think we've reached a few minutes over time as a result of my not being able to share my screen. But fortunately, it did work out. So I'd be happy to answer any questions um, if anybody has them. And let me end by thanking Representative Donovan, Chairwoman Donovan, it's exciting that this subcommittee was formed and that both Beth Dugan and I and Director Jones had an opportunity to share information with you about our older population. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And, and thank you both too. So that concludes today's presentation and our next meeting will be announced soon. And we hope to invite Director Jones back um, to talk about um, her Office of Healthy Aging and the programs and services there. So thank you everyone who joined in today. Thank you um, Representative Chippendale and thank those you. of you listening. Thank you. So that concludes. That concludes. Thank today. you. Good afternoon everyone. Thank you.